Good afternoon, my name is Richard Marks, and I'd like to welcome you to the first uh, in our Associated Student Speakers programs for this quarter. I guess you're some of the people who just now got the word that we're moved inside. But uh, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome our guest to campus. Probably no other individual in America did more to uh, set in motion the sequence of events which finally toppled Lyndon B. Johnson. And uh, although the final result wasn't uh, what we all quite had in mind, uh, our guest was at the Democratic Convention and he was one of the, uh, the p people pushing for the, uh, the minority Vietnam plank. He's currently on the uh, Board of Directors for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He's Vice Chairman of the Americans for Democratic Action. He was recently elected a congressman of the, uh, representing the dissident Democrats from New York. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our guest, Congressman Allard K. Lowenstein. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and allowing me to uh, participate in this series. I, when I read the uh, list of distinguished characters who were involved in the, in the program and what they were supposed to talk about, I had a sort of doubt that I was really qualified to appear and make any contribution. But the day that the invitation came from UCLA, there was also an announcement in the papers that uh, some of you may have seen that Mrs. Spiro T. Agnew had uh, been asked what her favorite kind of music was, and she had uh, said that classical music was her favorite. And they asked her what her favorite composition was, and she said Stardust. And <laughs> so I figured that if Stardust qualified as classical music, I could qualify as an expert on the future of American democracy. And I decided I would take part in the program. The nature of the dilemma the country's in is so obvious that I think on campuses it almost is uh, an act of condescension for anyone to come and recite the problems again. Therefore I will do it rather briefly and uh, we'll just, just say a few things about what I think we have to do about this problem and then hope that we can have some time for questions and answers and for whatever comments you would like to make. Does this thing move back at all or is that impossible? After Chicago, I get very suspicious of all these machines. <laughs> no? Can you pull it? Let's move that. Okay, that's good. Is that safe now? Very good. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me without it? Maybe it's. Oh. It's too big, okay. The, the basic question that I suppose all Americans face who were involved in last year's effort is whether the effort that was made last year and the results of that effort make it possible to uh, attempt at least to bring about the basic changes in American life that are so urgently needed without abandoning the hope that these changes can be made through democratic process. My reading of the last year is uh, very simple. that. Uh, against enormous odds and without any particular tradition that would make it likely this would work and with everybody that had any influence or any money saying it couldn't be done, that ordinary people in the country, particularly uh, at the beginning younger people, were able to produce the kind of political pressure that in fact did change the direction of this country and that if it had not been for the event of June the 5th in this city that we would have proceeded to nominate an elected president and that we would now be embarked on the uh, effort to uh, heal wounds and end wars that so clearly the country, in my judgment, was uh, seeking to produce. Now, if that reading is, is uh, correct, and it certainly is uh, as logical, I think, a reading of what happened as any other, then there is uh, a prima facie case that can be made that the difficulties of of this country are not the result of the continuing uh, venality or corruption or evil of the American people, that there's no reason to say that they can't, in fact, bring about the kind of social change through democratic process that's so urgently needed, but that, in fact, the reverse is the case, that 
uh, against terrible odds and with a great deal of, of uh, the kind of discouragement which, which we all experienced because this was something that everybody that knew better said couldn't be done, that despite all of that, uh, the president was retired, the bombing was stopped, the country was brought to the point where one of the major parties, in the face of the continued incumbency of its own president, reversed its political position so much so that even today the only Democrats who are mentioned for national leadership, uh, McGovern, uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, Muskie, uh, and even Hubert Humphrey, if he's still mentioned for national leadership, but all of them are now talking uh, in the language not of the recent Democratic administration at all, but in the language of the insurgency against that administration. That it's now an accepted fact that uh, this party, our party, the Democratic Party, if it's to be any kind of, uh, of contributor to the change of America, if it's going to have any way to get back into power, is going to have to move in directions that a year ago were considered to be heretical in that party. And that therefore, the best that you can do if you want to see America move toward ending the uh, horrors of our, of our present situation abroad and at home is to increase, not decrease, the effort to change things through the electoral process. Now, that brings up the, the, the new problem, which is for the first time in our history, we have no election to deal with, except in isolated specific areas, for a long time in the face of the enormous commitment to change through electoral pro politics that's been made by people. That's one reason why the Los Angeles election takes on such national importance, is because you have here an opportunity to hold up a particular standard and hold it effectively and successfully in a kind of period when that's not easily done elsewhere. And it makes a great deal of difference in terms of the psychology of the country that in Los Angeles that you do that and do it by as large a vote as you possibly can. Because certainly it would be difficult to think of any greater contrast in the attitude toward America and toward what America should be than is present in the two candidates for mayor of the city. But beyond the isolated case of an election here and an election there, how do you harness the national energies? How do you get people without uh, a national election to take part in the democratic process and show what they feel? Well, I'd suggest there's two areas which are primary right now for that kind of, of effort. The first has to do with the military budget. And connected to that military budget are the interpretations of what the country's needs are for other things. Because if the United States is, in fact, going to continue expending $81 billion uh, on military appropriations, we're not going to do anything else. If we're going to make this kind of, a, of an investment in uh, increasing amounts, because as you know, we've now been asked by the President to appropriate $7 million more for the ABM system, there isn't going to be any way that we can either reduce taxes or adjust the way in which we spend the rest of the money we collect from taxes, and there isn't going to be any way, therefore, that we can begin to do what is so urgently needed for uh, education and housing and welfare and transportation and pollution and all the other problems which, which are piling up. So we start with the priority, I think, of the way in which we're going to spend the national monies and particularly with the question of what we do with the military budget. And I think I might be wise just to talk for a little bit about that. I'm going to really have to move this because I can't see anybody and I get this. Hold on for one second. Now, just, can you? Does that work out better? Because I get the feeling I'm standing there behind some kind of a shield, and there's no talk behind a shield. I'd rather. All right. So what I what I'm trying to say is that I think we have to make the effort now to understand exactly what's at stake in the request, the first request that's come now, for this extraordinary appropriation for the ABM system. Any of you that have followed the arguments know that when Secretary McNamara first proposed it, his position was that. We needed to develop what he called an anti-Chinese, a Chinese-oriented thin system, uh, which would, in his, I have the quote here, I maybe should read it to you. He said that even the thick system would be no adequate shield against the Soviet Union, and the danger of the thin system was that by beginning an, a Chinese-oriented anti-ballistic -miss, anti missile system, we would, in fact, be urged into expanding it to an anti-Soviet one, which would lead to a terrible rise in the arms race, the arms cost, to no sensible purpose would not give us any security against the Soviet, and it would, in fact, make it very difficult for us to do other things we should do. Now, Secretary McNamara's position, therefore, was that we should construct a thin Chinese-oriented system, which we would put up at certain key population centers to defend us against, well, I guess you'd have to start with the assumption that there'd be a kind of mad Chinese dictator who would be in power in 1974 when they get 
missiles that they can deliver against the United States. And this mad Chinese dictator would decide that his primary goal was to destroy China as quickly as possible, since everyone knows that we have the uh, retaliatory power to destroy China three times in an hour or two. So that the assumption is that this mad dictator would arrive in power in 1974, or stay in power until 1974, and immediately upon acquiring these missiles would launch an attack against the United States with the determined desire to wipe China out as quickly as possible. But you have to understand how mad he has to be, because if this mad dictator comes to power in 74 and has these missiles which, against which the thin system would have any value, all he has to do is to wait 9 to 12 months, and he would have missiles which, in fact, would penetrate the thin system. So the mad dictator in 1974 has to be determined not only to wipe China out instantly, but he, wants to, he has to d decide he wants to wipe China out without waiting 9 or 12 months, by which time he could at least hit some places in the United States before China gets wiped out. And in his rush to wipe China out as quickly as possible, he has to also accommodate us, according to the original McNamara plan, by aiming the missiles he's going to aim at the United States at Seattle, Boston, and Chicago, which is where we were going to erect our defenses, the cities of Seattle, Boston, Chicago being obviously peculiarly valorous and in need of defense. Uh, we made clear that we would uh, produce these systems to defend those cities. Then a very odd thing happened. The good burghers of Seattle, having heard that they were to be protected against the hypothetically mad Chinese dictator who might attack them in 1974, decided that all things being considered, they would rather take a chance with the mad Chinese dictator attacking them than to have a series of missiles de defending Seattle, which could destroy them without the incentive of a mad Chinese dictator at all. So there was a great rumbling in the land, and we went through another reassessment. And then we came out with the president, new president's plan, which, as you know, is uh, clearly an improvement on the old one, because now we have the hypothetical mad Chinese dictator launching an assault against the United States in 1974, refusing to wait until 1975 in his desire for self-destruction. But instead of aiming his missiles at Seattle, Chicago, and Boston, where at least he might wipe out a major league ball team, he now has to <laughs> aim his, his efforts now have to be concentrated on wiping out Dry Gulch, Wyoming, or Montana, and North Dakota. Now, if you can believe that that is uh, the basis for the expenditure of $7 billion of money, of course, you can believe anything. You can believe the Duke of Wellington is the chancellor in residence here. You can take on any... So you watch this effort to persuade people that they ought to engage in this kind of, uh, of expenditure of money, and you think, that, well, let me tell you one other thing that came up last week, because this is what you face on a kind of daily basis in the House now. We were told last week that the president has decided that we should extend the uh, military bases the United States maintains in Spain. Now, there's uh, a subject that's worth special study. We have military bases in Spain. We have, in fact, 452 military bases scattered around the world. If you did a, a, a study on a chart of which of these 402 military bases seem least connected to United States security, you might have decided that the ones in Spain were close in the contest because they were constructed for the purpose at the time they were built of having a place where we could land the B-47s so they could refuel if there was a necessity of attacking the Soviet Union in retaliation. We don't use the B-47s anymore, so one raises the question, what are we doing with air bases in Spain, particularly since in 1963, when they were renewed, our own military leaders uh, were astute enough to predict that they would no longer need the military bases in Spain after that five years was up. Well, okay, so we have the bases expiring. What are we to do with them? The Pentagon uh, is never at a loss for intelligent explanations of these things, so they did a study. They had a general detached to Madrid who came up with uh, the explanation of, of why we need the military bases in Spain. I would be afraid to tell you this for fear I'd be giving away classified information if it hadn't appeared in the press. But the reason they came up with is that General Franco, who as we have known ever since the bases were installed there, is one of the few relics left defending the uh, world, the free world, against the possibility of assault. Uh, General Franco faces the possibility of uh, an attack on Spain by sort of hordes of Algerians uh, swimming, I suppose, across the Mediterranean, <laughs> accompanied, accompanied by what's called in the Pentagon uh, explanation, accompanied by a people's revolution, a so-called people's revolution mounted from the Spanish colonies in Africa. Now, if you're a student of Africa with microscopes, you'll notice that there are, in fact, two Spanish colonies left in Africa, deplorable though that may be, one of which is called the Spanish Sahara, 
where there are some 30,000 people on camels running about in the desert, and the other which is called Ifni. And so you have this image, if you want to understand what we're doing, of the uh, Franco government imperiled in its desire to preserve freedom against uh, any attack whatsoever by the possibility of an assault by Algerians, Spanish Saharans, and Ifnians to protect Spain against which we are now being told that we are going to have to spend whatever the sum of money is they finally come up with. The Spanish government asked for one billion dollars, which is of course perfectly reasonable against the possibility of such an assault. <laughs> We've already given the Spanish government in the past two billion dollars, two billion with a B, for these bases, and now the government is engaged in the uh, shrewd Yankee art of getting the price down. We were told recently that the Spanish government has modified its request. It's now down perhaps as far as 700 million. We've said we will give them, we won't give them a penny more than 150 million. We're now haggling and in the end it will be announced that we've saved an enormous amount of money in the United States by getting these bases, I suppose, for 100 million dollars, which is what we paid them in 1963 when, of course, we were told they would be obsolete by this time. So we're now going to end up, as a result of this new decision, uh, investing another a substantial sum of money in Spanish bases uh, because of the threat to Spain from these uh, you know, driven people of, of northern Africa. Well, I mean, if, if you can believe that, then of course the mad Chinese dictator begins to sound very plausible. So I've decided that's probably why the whole Spanish rationality has been presented. I, what I want to convey to you, if I can, is that the concept that we're functioning under, the whole process by which we're being asked to uh, uh, decide on our national needs and priorities, is in fact so out of whack that uh, there is very little that we can do about the urgency of the country's problems if we don't understand and resist this kind of nonsense. I told a group last night uh, about uh, an event that also occurred about a week ago, which uh, I mentioned just briefly in passing because of course the sum of money involved is so minuscule as to not be worth the concern of ordinary Americans who have to live on it for several years. But there was, I had a phone call from Aaron Henry a while ago in Jackson and he sounded very upset. He said, could I find out why Jackson, Mississippi seemed to have become the center of all air, ta air activities in the United States? That goes off whenever it wants to. I have no control over it. <laughs> the last time it went off was in a trench in Biafra when we were all whispering and being terrified that we might be assassinated by approaching Nigerians and it went off. So. Uh, so anyway, we looked into the question of why were all the airplanes in the United States, why were all the jet planes in the United States suddenly landing in Jackson, Mississippi, and it turned out that there was a testimonial dinner that night in Jackson for Senator Stennis, who, as you know, is a personage of, uh, of noble rank and title and who was having a testimonial dinner to which it became necessary for the whole Joint Chiefs of Staff to go. Now, one can sympathize with their uh, desire to eat dinner with Senator Stennis and Jackson being somewhere near Madrid in the litany of marvelous defenders of freedom, cities which are urgent to the free world. One supposes that they go there periodically to get recharged. But the point was they were going to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, at whose expense? At your expense. They were not flying commercially as lesser folk have had to do, going back and forth on the uh, inscrutable ways of Delta Airlines and arriving in time to eat and go home. Not at all. They were going at a cost. We asked the Pentagon uh, how much it would uh, uh, cost the taxpayer for these joint chiefs to go to Jackson for dinner, and it turned out that the cost was estimated variously between twenty-eight and forty-two thousand dollars, which of course is, as I say, a rather minor amount of money. It's just enough so that we could have funded the poverty program in my congressional district to keep two hundred and fifty people in on-the-job training courses that we had to stop. But after all, dinner for the joint chiefs in Jackson is, uh, is a priority, and when I asked the Pentagon to explain why they had done this somewhat Indignantly, I was told that the Congress had voted the money. It was in the budget. Why was I complaining? This was the people's will. It was part of the uh, public relations budget, perfectly legitimately appropriated, and they were using it. So that what you should understand is not only are you uh, being asked to finance all these extraordinary investments in irrelevancy, but also you're being asked to pay for the propaganda effort to persuade you to pay for the rest of the effort. And that's the circle that you're caught into. There are, there are missile bases in northern Italy now uh, which are, are costing us, I forget the exact figure on each of these, but it's somewhere in the, in, in the millions of dollars. I think the figure for one year now runs to 17 million, but that may be low. And do you know where these missiles are aimed in case of attack against the United States so that we feel totally secure as you go about your business? They're aimed at Yugoslavia. So if any of you were afraid of an attack launched by 
Tito against this country or against Fiume or whoever else Tito might attack, be, be secure that uh, we are, in fact, uh, defended by missiles aimed in northern Italy against Yugoslavia so that not only can we protect uh, General Franco against the Ifnians and, uh, and people of Dry Gulch, Wyoming against the mad Chinese dictator, but we're completely safe against an attack launched by, uh, by General Tito if he should decide that he's bored with his old age. Now, what, what, what emerges from all this, what I hope everybody can, can understand is that unless we call this thing to a halt, unless we make it very clear that the time has ended when the Congress of the United States is going to be a kind of quartermaster corps issuing new missile systems in search of rationales and, and uh, authorizing wide uh, exploration of new places where we can put new bases in which we can invest large new sums of money and get ourselves involved in, uh, in weird new adventures. Unless we call a halt to all of this, the rest of what we're talking about becomes chatter because, in fact, it's going to be impossible to begin to do the kinds of things that we have to do. Now, the other focus I think we have to be aware of is on the procedural problems of getting democracy to work in the United States. Uh, the elections last year established, as I suggested at the beginning of my talk, suggested, established at least for some of us that the American people, given options and opportunities to function, are not always going to choose the, uh, the narrow, the racist, the venal, the stupid, or any of these things which sometimes we're told by people they would choose. The difficulty is that having made a choice, how is it carried through in this country? What is the implementation process? Well, I don't think until you've been in the House of Representatives for a while, you can be quite aware of how extraordinarily difficult it is for the legislative process to function. Uh, we, we, we exist under an enormous sort of blanket, which goes endlessly in all directions, sort of, I don't know, like Calcutta. You can't sort of quite get out from under it, and the more you squirm around, the more you know, sort of encumbered you find yourself in trying to do anything. The, the apex of the blanket, if that's an acceptable image, is uh, something called the seniority system. As you know, we govern the House of Representatives under, and the Senate under a sort of system of advanced geriatrics where you sort of wait to see who's going to last the longest. And at that point, all virtue having inhered in that fact, uh, whoever it is that's lasted the longest acquires a power that would have made the czar feel very jealous. The, the chairman of a committee can decide who can get on the committee, what bills can be heard, what resolutions can be offered, what hearings are held. He can, in fact, control virtually all the legislative process that the Congress of the United States wants to engage in in the area that he as chairman controls. And since most of these chairmen in the process of elections come from areas which are one party and where one race can vote, you have a system where a very small number of people can, in fact, determine, except after, say, an assassination or in the middle of a depression, can determine what legislation the Congress can even, can even vote on, let alone how, how bills can be uh, considered. We, we go to the floor of the House. Uh, we've been there now three months. Normally, we arrive uh, for sort of a prayer meeting at noon, which is always very highly uh, moral in its purpose. We, we invoke divine guidance. We get it, and then we leave, which perhaps uh, reflects what the will of the Lord may be, but more likely reflects the decision of the leadership. And, in, in this series of non-meetings that we've been having, we did have one subject that seemed to, to have some uh, consequence, not major perhaps, but at least symbolically important, which was the business about the House on American Activities Committee. We wanted to have a debate on that. We thought maybe that would be something which would uh, give us a chance to discuss what purposes the government had, and again, the expenditure of money, enormous amounts of money, as well as uh, the invasion of, uh, of areas that the Constitution seems to protect. Uh, we were allowed a one-hour debate on, on, on HUAC. That, as you can see, is perfectly reasonable since we were so pressed with other things to do that we, uh, to ask for more than an hour might have been an intrusion on the uh, priorities of the country. We went for the hour. As you perhaps know, the chairman of the Rules Committee who allocates the time for debate on HUAC is a gentleman that I suspect would feel flattered if he heard me say that he's somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun. He uh, <laughs> generously allotted... Uh, a half an hour for uh, discussion on the part of uh, the Democratic membership. I uh, think you're all aware of how you get time under those conditions. If you polish enough apples long enough, you may be accorded a minute uh, to participate in the debate. And in that one minute, as you can easily see, there's no reason why you can't articulate the frustrations and hopes of generations of Americans. 
And so at the end of your one minute, you then, of course, converted all the people who were uh, not on the floor because they don't have to listen to you and are so grateful that they vote with you, and that's the end of the debate on HUAC. We had a seven-hour debate on seating Adam Powell, very heated debate if you believe the press. This was a great test of the democratic process. The only trouble was that about five and a half hours of the seven hours uh, consisted of roll calls, uh, sort of interspiced with points of order that were normally rather inaudible and rulings which were not very much more audible. But th the way that you function on a roll call is also important to understand. You don't, it's not that you're having your, your roll call to, to record yourself on an issue. Normally a roll call is a quorum call, the, the purpose of which is, de is defined as establishing the fact that there's enough people present to conduct business. Now the way it works is they call everybody's name twice. That's 435 people. You, uh, the acoustics are so organized that nobody can hear you when you reply, so the clerk replies what you've said, repeats what you've said, and it takes, say, 45 minutes to get through one of these quorum calls. Now, w if anyone sits there through the quorum calls, you have to be very doubtful they have anything else to do, because the only purpose, I suppose, would be to memorize over a period of weeks all 435 names. You don't get a desk. You can't sort of clandestinely do your mail. So you go there. You get to discover when your name is going to be called on the roll. Uh, I, when I know that uh, Jerry Cohelan has been called, I have 10 minutes and 30 seconds to dash over for the first roll. I have about 32 minutes for the second roll. You go over and you answer the roll call to establish the fact that you're doing valiant duty for the people, and then you leave. So at the end of the roll call, the, the speaker will announce the 299 people being present. Uh, the House can now conduct its business, and any child who is not myopic to the point of blindness can gaze upon the floor and discover that if there are eight people there, it's a rather record number. <laughs> and so that we, we tried reform. We said, well, okay, we can't get rid of seniority immediately. We've got a problem of dealing with um, some of these basic rules, but perhaps we could get the Democratic caucus to reform at least the minimal process to save everybody's time so that we would not intrude on these busy men with, uh, with all this irrelevancy. We tried in the caucus, Congressman Reese uh, wanted to make a motion uh, for consideration of rules changes. He was out of order, of course. Uh, the motion he wanted to propose, a very dangerous motion, was that if uh, an amendment to a bill was proposed that had 25 or more words, we would have to be able to have a copy of what we were voting on to, uh, to see. Now, you can tell without my you know, sort of elucidating further what a disastrous uh, revolutionary effect it would have if we knew what we were voting on by having a copy of it. So he, of course, we, that was not discussed in the caucus, uh, was out of order. We did get a concession from the leadership that they would study the possibility of installing electronic voting. This was hailed in the papers as a step in the right direction, modernization. Uh, we now find that uh, the three or four million dollars that's involved in installing these uh, gadgets with which we could vote uh, in a more modern way, that if they install them, they're still going to keep uh, the roll calls. But what will happen is that when your name is called on the roll, instead of replying, you will push a button to indicate you're present. <laughs> and if this is adopted by the House, you will discover what uh, modernization really means. It will be, again, a significant stride toward democratization and so on. I, I want to make clear that uh, these processes of, of legislation, if that's what they are, this whole system uh, can be changed. I, uh, I'm always afraid if I if I just list these things and not, and not make very clear uh, what I think the truth is, that I, I will feed people's sense of incapacity to function in this country. And that's not what I'm saying. These things can be changed. They can be changed because a majority of the membership of the Congress knows that they're absurd. You can't find people to defend the process by which the House of Representatives now functions. Uh, but what we have to have is the concerted effort that will make clear that enough people are going to care so, so that the political weight of change is great enough to make it a priority. Otherwise, the ordinary person says, well, why should I throw myself into an effort to change when all it means is I buck the leadership, I won't be able to get on the committee I want, I won't have any opportunity to influence the course of uh, affairs in my district, and I might, might not even get reelected because they can make it more difficult for me to survive. What you have to have is the momentum from the country saying that we're going to do away with the Electoral College, we're going to do away with the seniority system, we're going to make all these kinds of barnacles that the democratic process has developed in terms of being able to, to solve its problems through democratic procedure, that these things are going to stop. And it's my conviction that this year, to go back to where we started, that on the questions that are most concerned in the United States now, from the military budget through the procedures of the Congress, and the things that flow from those procedures, that is the block in the way of doing something about the tax structure and so on, the 
Uh, I'm now, as you know, one of the leading authorities in the United States on uh, problems of agriculture. Um, as a sort of living monument to the brilliance of the committee system, Sir Shirley Chisholm uh, and I were uh, launched into agricultural orbit. Uh, and she was then, uh, she being the first black congresswoman from, she's from Brooklyn, she was then placed on subcommittee on forestry and uh, rural villages. So <laughs> she, it's a, you can tell it's a very uh, cultured leadership in the Democratic Party. It remembered about the tree that grew in Brooklyn and felt it was only proper to put her on forestry. She's now off, which leaves me as the senior uh, sort of figure in dealing with agricultural problems. And we did a hearing in the Agriculture Committee uh, room the other day on the welfare problem in Beaufort and Jasper counties. We had 50 welfare uh, mothers and fathers uh, come in and, and explain what the situation is that they live under. You're familiar, I think, with that. You're familiar with the problem of the uh, great pickers in California. You understand exactly how in agriculture, as in every other aspect that uh, we've touched on today, the, the system is topsy-turvy. People are paid $4 billion a year in this country not to grow food, most of them not even farmers, but corporate farms. And that $4 billion that they're paid not to grow food is, of course, an enormous investment of the money of people who, in fact, as in Beaufort and Jasper counties, are functioning without any uh, opportunity to get enough food, to, to be eligible for the celebrated food stamp, free food stamp program that the agriculture department's announced. You have to earn less than $20 a month for a family of four or less than $30 for a family of five. And you figure out what that says to people. You figure out what we're doing with this kind of, of diagnosis as to what to do with our funds in agriculture as in taxation, as in the overall budget. And as in my judgment, we go into these questions, it becomes clearer and clearer that there is a crisis now that uh, involves the energies of all Americans who want to see this country respond to injustice and respond to the absurdities that have developed through a process of legislation and democracy and not through decrees or confrontations which escalate in hostility and produce, as, as I judge, uh, the results uh, and increase the rigidity on the part of the things that have to be changed. So what I would suggest, and I'd like to stop then so we can uh, have an opportunity to talk together. I, I'd like to suggest to you that the evidence is clear. As far as you can go by evidence, and evidence is never conclusive, nothing is ever inevitable in political life, but the evidence is clear that there is enough momentum in the country and enough concerned people in the country to work together to bring about an overhauling of all these very bad situations which have developed, that there is no alternative plan to bring about change which has produced results that are in terms of any kind of objectivity are impressive results that therefore the choice that most people have is to give up entirely and decide that the thing is so bad there's nothing can be done about it and let it burn down or else to get in as much as they can as vigorously as they can on the priority questions that face us now to stop the military budget to overhaul the procedures of congress to get on with the business of rebuilding our domestic economy along constructive lines to produce sufficient pressure so that we get out of the Vietnamese situation without further delay, to get on with ending the draft, to do the things that we know have to be done if the educational system is to meet the, uh, the needs of the country. All these things, uh, it seems to me, are interlocked now, and therefore it is not uh, the kind of, of situation which lends itself to uh, being solved piecemeal. If we don't take on the military budget and the procedures, we're not going to get to the other questions. If we don't get to them, we're not going to be able to reverse the trend toward coming unstuck, which has been so clearly the uh, price we're paying for neglect and for hypocrisy and for abdication. I, I thought in view of the season that it is now, and since every day is in, in this season something of an anniversary for everybody, I thought that it would be important to uh, finish what I'm saying by reading you what I suppose is the most prophetic uh, state of statement that, uh, that I've heard. Uh, made by anybody in, uh, in recent American history. It was made by Senator Kennedy on the uh, day after the assassination of Dr. King. And he said in Cleveland, he said this, he said, this is a time of shame and sorrow and not a day for politics, but I've saved this opportunity to speak briefly to you about the mindless menace of violence in America, which again stains our land and every one of our lives. The victims of violence are black and white, famous and unknown, but they are most important of all human beings whom other human beings loved and needed. What has violence accomplished and what has it ever created? No wrongs have been righted. A sniper 
is a coward, not a hero, and an uncontrollable mob is the voice of madness, not the voice of people. Whenever any American's life is taken by another American, unnecessarily, whether it's done in the name of the law or in defiance of the law, whenever we tear at the fabric of life which another man has painfully and clumsily woven for himself and his children, the whole nation is degraded. But there is another kind of violence, slower but just as deadly, destructive as the shot or as the bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference and inaction and slow decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men because their skin has different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. This is the breaking of a man's spirit by denying him the chance to stand as a father and as a man among other men, and this too afflicts us all, so that we learn at the last to look at our brothers as aliens, men with whom we share a city but not a community, men bound to us in common dwelling but not in common effort, and we learn finally to share only a common fear, only a common desire to retreat from each other and a common impulse to meet disagreement with force. Well, it seems to me that we are at the point where with Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King gone and the disasters of the land worsening, uh, that all of us who remain convinced that the goals that were sought were the right goals and that the alternatives are not acceptable, uh, that we have to uh, attempt to do what for ordinary people is very difficult to do, which is to do without giants what would have been very difficult to do with giants. But I don't believe for one moment that uh, the American people, given uh, the kind of options they have, really have any choice but to make that effort. And it seems to me very clear that the will of this country being what it is and the opportunities that we have under this incredible bounty that we've been lavished by, by the Lord, that there is no reason in the world why we can't, in fact, uh, right wrongs and heal wounds and end wars. And I hope we at least make that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Lowenstein has said that he will uh, answer any question you have, and I hope that uh, if you, we have the, the two floor mics, we'll alternate and uh, see what type of a discussion we can get going. Why don't we start uh, right over here, and uh, is that turned on? Yes, I think so. Okay. Congressman, you've uh, spoken very eloquently on the situation as you see it, and you've You've said a lot of things that I didn't know specifically about the defense situation, but I don't think you've said much to me that would uh, give me any idea of what I ought to do. Well, uh, the first thing you ought to do is to win an election in Los Angeles, and I would discuss that if I didn't feel some inhibition as to whether outsiders doing that helps or hurts, but I hope I made very clear that there is an enormous uh, amount riding on what happens here in the next few weeks because what happens here has to be a symbol that we are either going to move toward the kinds of goals that we talk about or that we're going to move away from them. And uh, if I were anywhere near Los Angeles, I can't think of anything that would be worth diverting energy from until that election's over because the, it isn't just a question of electing a good mayor for the city of Los Angeles. It's also a question of doing it by sufficiently large a margin in all parts of the city so it's clear that there are certain kinds of politics that don't succeed and certain kinds that do. And I think you have, I, I envy anyone that's in Los Angeles at this time because of what the opportunity is that you have here to say something which would inspire people in the country the way New Hampshire did a year ago. Now beyond that, I could give you a series of proposals on, and let me do them very briefly. I think uh, that the test in, in Congress is going to be on the ABM, the first test on the military budget. I wish I could say it's going to be on Spain. I wish I could see any hope that we could rally enough people to say that the lunacy of continuing these bases is not acceptable, but I find that it's difficult to get people uh, involved in that, perhaps because it seems as if it's such a small sum of money comparatively. So while I would hope we could do that on Spain, I think we actually can do it on the ABM. There's enough resistance now so that 
if there is a general resurgence of opposition to that proposal, we're going to beat it in Congress. And if we beat it in Congress, one thing that you have to remember is that uh, President Nixon has never been overly burdened by being uh, unduly married to any one set of principles, as you in California will recall. And it's, it strikes me that if we're able to, to stop this ABM proposal and its tracks, that we may have a very different political orientation to deal with from, from his uh, position. So I think there's a lot riding on stopping the ABM. How do you do that? Well, you have in California the largest uh, quarry of congressional votes to capture that any state has. It would seem to me that if we could get every California congressman aware of the people's feelings on this question, that we have one-tenth of the votes we need to stop the ABM in the House. Um, and I think that's in itself something that uh, what you do is to organize yourself so that you know what congressional districts you're from and what the vote is going to be of the, of the gentleman representing that district and be sure that in any district uh, in California, there are very few districts in California where you don't have a chance to influence the incumbent because you have enough swing districts to, to be effective. It's not like some places where there's very little, little you can do because the district is so clearly one way or the other. Where you have a swing district, you can do a great deal, it seems to me, by making clear that there are a couple of thousand people in that district who are not going to support a candidate for re-election if he stands for the kind of uh, priorities and the kind of, of investment that the ABM represents. On congressional reform, uh, we're going to bring a bill, bill to the floor this year in one way or another. We're going to change this system. It's just gone too long. And how we get it to the floor, if we can't get the, the Rules Committee to give us a rule, which is what you normally do, we're going to get a discharge petition. When we get to that, we have to have 218 signatures. At that point, we need the help again of people to be sure there's no reason why any congressman from this state shouldn't sign a discharge petition to support the efforts of people to reform the Congress. Congressman Reese has been very active in the effort, as you know, and has got uh, done a considerable amount to make the uh, spade work easier, and he, he will need support. So on the specifics that come along, I think everybody should be aware of the fact that you can, this, uh, in this way, influence the uh, direction of things. The election here will influence, and the response to these specific subjects will. The trouble that people sometimes have is that they think that, that you can take um, the, the sense of impatience that we have, and, if, and with that sense of impatience, unless you give some program which involves an immediate confrontation of some sort, that you're not doing anything, whereas in fact the reverse is very often the case. There's no 11th commandment that says thou shalt uh, demonstrate. There are times when demonstrations are constructive, and I think when they are, they should be done. I think on the war, we're getting to the point where it's going to be very important to resume the kind of demonstrations that will make clear people want to get out of Vietnam. I don't think there's any... And I, I think that on that, we ought to uh, begin again to tell the president precisely how deeply people feel, that they're not prepared to watch this thing drag itself along for uh, forever. So when you ask what can you do, I'm afraid without making a very uh, glib kind of reply, I'd have to say that on each of these issues there are different tactics that could be employed. One thing it seems to me is overdue is for people like yourself, and if there's a group of people here who are interested, maybe we can, when we get through with the general question, sit down for five or ten minutes and talk about this, but you ought to be in touch with people who feel like you do elsewhere, because that, that's of course what the secret was, if there was one, to the Dump Johnson movement, was that everybody felt the same way, but nobody knew anyone else did, and therefore there were these pockets of people feeling like they were sort of spitting in the ocean, and until they came together and realized how much there was in the way of their own feeling, they weren't able to achieve things. But if we can get people in touch with each other again and working together, uh, the, on most of these questions, we can in fact represent, I think, a majority of the concerned people in the country, which is what's going to make the decisions that need to be made. Over here, there's some. Uh, with regard to Spain, Congressman. Uh, Talk a little bit louder if you can. I don't know if this mic uh, is on or what. But uh, concerning the Spanish bases, it's possible I was misinformed uh, from what you said. I gather I am. I thought they were primarily submarine bases, which were essential for the Sixth Fleet. There's one uh, submarine base at Rota, but there are th the uh, majority of the bases are air bases that are located in Spain for uh, air, air purposes. Now, the uh, submarine base at Rota uh, does not, according to the uh, Spanish government at least, allow submarines, nuclear submarines, to harbor there. They have a submarine tender which harbors there. One has the suspicion that if one needs a place for a submarine tenant to harbor, one might use Gibraltar, which is 60 miles away, by some arrangement with the British. Doesn't seem as if the inconvenience of having to go 60 miles away would 
uh, destroy the effectiveness of the uh, United States submarine fleet, a uh, nuclear submarine fleet. Uh, I, I think you might even say that uh, it, it's possible that uh, using the bases which we have in, uh, in Great Britain for nuclear submarines since they uh, go under for periods of several hundred days would be adequate for them to churn about doing whatever it is they need to do. Uh, so I'm not persuaded that the existence of the submarine base at Rota even contributes the convenience of the uh, fleet by any significant amount. If it did, I would still say that the inconvenience politically and economically is just too great to warrant feeling that we need that convenience of being 60 miles uh, away from Gibraltar and using it as a, as a place for a tender to dock. Uh, I don't know the size of the facilities there. Uh, and also, since you're not on the appropriate committees, I don't know whether, uh, whether you're informed as to whether our s nuclear submarine. I can't hear you. Could you talk in the machine? Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, I don't know. From what you said, our nuclear submarines theoretically don't use the base. Uh, are you in a position to know whether this is a reality or not? In dealing with, uh, with the military, it's very difficult to determine uh, reality. I think your point is well taken. I, uh, is the reality that we are really constructing an anti-ballistic missile system to defend uh, uh, Montana against a mad Chinese dictator? I doubt it. I can only go by what they say is what they're doing, and what they say is what they're doing in Spain defies any kind of rational understanding. Now, if they have some secret motivation, then I think it's time the American people knew what it was. I don't think that we can be expected to approve in blank every time that the military asks for, for uh, another series of bases. I would put the question the other way. What case can be possibly made uh, that would suggest that our security is, is strengthened by having 452 bases overseas? Is there any case that can be made? Shouldn't they have to make that case to the American people the way the OEO has to when it wants a program or the way the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare does? Every other department has to present its reasons, argue for them, account for its monies, and then take its chances. But the Defense Department doesn't, and so as you suggest, maybe the reason they want the bases in Spain is unconnected with the reasons that have been given. Maybe, in fact, uh, there's a totally new set of reasons. It's not the Algerians and the Spanish Sahara, and it's not uh, the air bases. Maybe they feel that they've discovered some secret herb in the south of Spain, which we get and which can paralyze millions of people upon breathing it. I'd, I don't know, but I find very little to suggest to me that I should go on appropriating money for things which sound loony on the grounds that there may be some even uh, some some less loony reason less visible that we haven't heard about. As I don't know how else you deal with that question really, because I don't know whether the nuclear submarines secretly use a base against the agreement we've signed. I suppose they don't. Referring merely to the uh, the fact that uh, there are some agreements which are on paper but which are generally recognized uh, are only for local political purposes in the country involved, like theoretically we aren't bombing Laos. Uh, and I didn't intend Maybe to what you're doing you some deep, dark yeah. secret about it. I was just asking a question. Well, I can't answer it. I, my, my own hunch is that any rational American discussing the question of whether we need a nuclear submarine base in Spain, even if the Defense Department uh, were to say we did need it, it would be entitled to say we don't need it. My view is we do not need a nuclear submarine base in Spain. Uh, so therefore, I'm, I would be unimpressed with the disclosure, if it were true, that they're secretly using this base and that they can't admit it for political reasons in Spain. I just can't conceive of anything involved in the security of the United States that makes us any more secure by having a nuclear submarine base in Spain. I must say I don't know what we need Guantanamo for, if we want to get into that. There certainly is no evidence that there's any additional military security of this country to have a base in Cuba at this point. Uh, we have Puerto Rico, which is very close by and which is, for all intents and purposes, uh, just as useful as a place to defend the Panama Canal from. I don't know what it did for the British to invade Anguilla. I must say there are tremendous numbers of mysterious things going on in the military world which leave me puzzled, and I don't think that I have to abdicate my judgment about these things simply because I can't think of any reason they make sense. The kind of logic you get into then is sort of Alice in Wonderland. Precisely because we can't figure out why it makes sense, it must make sense because it's so obviously stupid that there's got to be some reason we haven't thought of for doing it. Well, I'm not prepared to engage in that kind of charity toward the Defense Department after listening to their estimation of what would happen at the Bay of Pigs and in Vietnam and other places. It seems to me they stand convicted by their own incompetence.
And I'm not questioning motives. I want to make that clear. I'm not saying these aren't high-minded men. I, I'm perfectly prepared to say they're high-minded men. I, my problem is that most high-minded of men can make the most insane of decisions. That's what we've learned in the last few years. I, I can't think of anyone whose uh, pretensions of being high-minded were greater than Lyndon Johnson's. He talked more about peace and doubtless meant it. And look where he got us. So uh, I think we have a right to expect something more than high-mindedness uh, in, in the leadership of the country. And we're not getting it in these areas that we've been discussing. I wish I, wish I could accept your, your proof of the, the Dump Johnson movement the Dump Johnson movement as proof that the American people are basically enlightened or liberal or wise. However, it seems that on the particular issue of Vietnam, there are enough selfish motives which overrode and, and made the Dump Johnson movement possible. These, issue, these selfish motives, however, would not be there in, in the more basic issues of racism and things like this. Do you really think that, that on the basic question of racism, for instance, that the American people are as enlightened or, or whatever, as they seem to be in the Vietnam issue. Well, you stated my hypothesis more affirmatively than I did. I didn't say that American people are basically wise, liberal, and enlightened. What I said is that given options and leadership and programs, the, that, that part of the American people which can be raised to a higher level can respond. And that there's no question the American people, like any people, can also descend to very, very low levels of political misbehavior. I don't, I don't want to sound like Pollyanna, just saying that on everything all you have to do is get the people to, uh, to decide, and they'll decide wisely. That, of course, would be deceptive. But what I think is clear is that in this particular situation that we're in now, that it is not inevitable that the American people will make wrong decisions. For a long time, we were told that there was no way you could reach them on Vietnam. And while you now can say that, well, of course, they had selfish reasons to respond on that, it's the fact that a year ago, or just over a year ago, nobody would agree with that. Everybody said there's no way you can reach the American people on Vietnam. The peace movement had all but, all but given up. People had been escalating their protests and burning draft cards and throwing themselves in front of troop trains and were saying there's nothing you can do to make the American people realize that the war is bad. They're uh, imperialists. They're racist. They want to wipe out the uh, Vietnamese. I heard that, and I'm sure you did, from every sort of left-wing orator in the United States. It was just an, a foregone conclusion. And Ramparts exposed the whole effort to oppose President Johnson as a, as a deliberate uh, deception on the part of myself and Senator McCarthy and a few other people who were probably hired by the CIA to destroy the peace movement. In fact, they came out with that uh, with uh, their usual extraordinarily good timing four days before New Hampshire, as sort of proof of the whole bankruptcy of this effort. Senator McCarthy was going to get 6%, I think they said, in New Hampshire, which puts them up with Lyndon Johnson and being accurate in their political prophecies. So I don't find myself uh, persuaded of the accuracy of the judgment that says the American people can't respond to the problem of race. I think it's very, very clear that they don't automatically respond to it. I think it's very clear that in many instances they respond wrongly. But I also think that there are indications, and Los Angeles has provided, has provided a very specific one, that there are indications that this country does not need to respond always with the worst kind of action, and that sometimes with leadership that's provided in a way which, is, which produces trust and produces a sense that change is possible without violence, that people respond in a very affirmative fashion. I got elected, let me just make a confession, because I think this is part of the whole uh, situation that one has to weigh. I was elected in a district which is Republican, rather heavily Republican. I said the same things in that district that I've said all my life about not only the war and defense appropriations, but also about race. I was elected in the middle of a tremendous sea of hate that came out of New York City over the Ocean Hill Brownsville controversy. My opponent made a tremendous issue of the fact that I was one of those Jews that was prepared to help Negroes wipe us out. It was a very, very messy kind of campaign because of this tremendous uh, increment of hate that was blowing over from the city next door. And with all of that, uh, in the end, we didn't lose. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that everybody there is naturally in agreement with everything that I would hope they would like. It doesn't mean that they've all become prepared to accept uh, uh, racial justice and so on. What it does mean, though, is that given choices, which is, of course, what politics is all about, people can, even with rather in, ineffectual candidates, people can uh, turn to something which makes hope possible that we can change. Now, I don't know what the alternative is to that. That's what always troubles me with this question. I can't guarantee that we're going to heal the racial hate and make justice possible. I can guarantee, if we quit, that we won't. I can guarantee, and I think anyone can see it, that if the United States descends into a period in which, in fact, the whole effort to make justice possible is given up because we have no proof it will succeed, that we have absolute guarantees that it won't succeed. 
and that the United States therefore has to become, has to just come unstuck. Does any black profit from that? Does any white profit from that? It just doesn't seem to me that happens. It seems to me that what happens is that all of us go under. And if the country goes under as a result of this kind of, of, of abdication on our part, the people who suffer the most are, I think, the American people in general. I can't believe that, therefore, that there's any case that can be made against making the effort I'm talking about, not because I'm guaranteeing success or because I'm unaware of the fact that people live with a residue of, of, of malice and hate in them, which can be also very effectively appealed to. But because, uh, let me just go back to Robert Kennedy for a minute, because it's, it seems to me that if you wanted to understand the political reality of the thing without indulging in any kind of just flights of fancy, uh, George Wallace did get 10 million votes. And I've heard that cited as proof of the inherent racism and reactionary attitudes of the American people. And in a sense, of course, it does reflect the fact that there are a large number of people who are really quite indifferent on the question of race, who, who voted for George Wallace, despite his racism, who were previously voting for Robert Kennedy. In fact, according to the polls that I've seen, the largest percentage of Wallace votes were Kennedy votes. Now what happened was that the frustrations of people who can't see that the life in this country has any any real hope for them, who are sick of the, of the status quo, who want basic social change, but who aren't in any ideological bag, rather than accept a choice of the kind which to them represented a continuation of all the things that are least acceptable, went from one alternative to another alternative. And those alternatives were not the same kind of things, but where Kennedy was able to get the support of people on the grounds that he represented basic change and was a man that could be trusted and identified with, Wallace inherited them because neither Humphrey nor Nixon uh, gave that kind of, of sense to people. And what I think that says is, is that the, there are these vast numbers of non-ideological, confused Americans who are sick of the, thing, the, way, the way things are, who just want to have the sense that somebody knows their problems and cares about them and will work on them. And I think if we harness that kind of support, as, uh, as Kennedy was doing, if we can make that kind of, of frustration part of the general uh, political base that we're building, then we'll, we're going to have the, uh, enough people going for programs which will represent social change and justice. And if we don't, and George Wallace does, then of course it will work the other way. So it's not automatic, and it's not that everybody is, 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 is a lover and a decent human being, and that's all there is to it. What it is is that there are these potentials in people, for good or for bad, and that the prospect, in my judgment, of their responding in effective ways and good ways depends on our filling the chasm and not sounding like we've accepted as inevitable the things that they don't want. Mr. Congressman, I'd like to focus my question on the, on the Congress itself. Um, we hear a great deal about the Senate these days. The Senate seems to be alive and active and liberal, and there seems to be hope coming out of the Senate we hear nothing about the House. The House seems moribund, and it seems rather rather ineffective. And in terms of any of the liberal programs, we really don't look for much from the House itself. Now, I have really two parts to my question. First, on the substantive issues, are there enough people to uh, bring about positive votes in the House on things like the ABM, on the various welfare programs, on the Spanish issue? I don't know whether it's going to come up, but let's assume I mean, for the first question, are there people, are there enough congressmen who you could line up on the substantive, substantive yes. question, leaving aside the procedural questions, that would back the kinds of positions you would like to see, see taken? And uh, also, I would just like to add here uh, that many of these questions really don't affect the voters in general. I mean, the idea of getting up a lot of votes for these kinds of things, the questions are fairly clear. The congressman can decide. The voters in their district really have no opinion one way or the other. And if the congressman simply says, I took this position for the following good reasons, the people will generally accept it. So they're not the kinds of things you have to drum up popular, popular support to back the congressman on. The second part of my question, leaving aside these, the, the, the substance, Procedurally, if you're constantly frustrated by the leadership, if you're constantly frustrated by the procedures, if you have, let's say, 20 or 30 percent of the Congress that agree with you, that are liberal, the big city congressmen, the congressmen from the working class districts, whoever they might happen to be, and you get good people and you're constantly frustrated by the system, how long are you going to take it and continue to do what you can, which might be minimal, without trying to change things within the Congress itself, even if, you, if, even if you have to pound on the table, or dump, in effect, dump Johnson, figure out some way of dumping the system 
or bringing powers to bear to bring about a change so these kinds of uh, positive and liberal and forward policies can be affected, become effective against this old system that doesn't allow these things to, uh, to, to be brought forth, to be brought into effect. Well, I guess those questions tend to, to merge, really. I th my judgment about it is that the reason the House is ineffective is that the House functions under rules which make it almost impossible for the House to be effective. Therefore, in the Senate, where the rules are a great deal more permissive and where the individual senator has a great deal more latitude, there is a great deal more possibility of effective leadership being felt and being heard. And so we have to have a change in the procedures of the House to become anything like as effective as we ought to be. So if we don't change procedures, then I think we atrophy, and I think it's very true that the Congress as a legislative body is, is in fact in question now, as it cannot cope with the problems of the country. But I, I'm not... Uh, as pessimistic as you sound about the changes that I think have to be brought about in the House because it does seem to me that the, the vast majority of individual members of the House are fed up with the way the thing works and knowing that from talking with them and knowing the sense in the country of frustration all you have to do is to bring an alliance about where this kind of desire for change in the, is felt sufficiently on the members of the House from their own constituents so that it becomes politically worth their trouble in trying to bring about change, and you'll get change. And that's not something that I think is 20 years away. I think on the reform bill, I think we might get, I think we might very well get there this year, this session. I, um, I don't think, what I'm trying to tell you is that I don't Did think that the, that the kind of change that's necessary is at all remote. I think like the Dump Johnson movement, which is an interesting analogy, that it looks completely remote because at the moment, since it's not moving, nobody thinks it can move. But you begin it, and the number of accretions to it will make it very clear that it's got power behind it enough so that people will join it who ordinarily would not. Now, uh, I can give examples of that, but I think in view of the hour, what I'd rather say is just that the, the most difficult coalition is not uh, black and white or Kennedy and McCarthy or these things we usually recite about. It's the coalition between patience and impatience, which is very tough. It's the impatience to demand that things change and to say if they don't change, we are going to make these efforts to get them changed. We're not going to sit by and watch in the name of sort of time. But with that kind of impatience, you have to have enough patience to let the things you're doing take root. And in a very large country with very set ways, it's very difficult to get these kinds of changes done as quickly as we would like. So therefore, I, I find the students who are frustrated because last year's effort didn't produce a president they wanted, are, it's perfectly right to feel that impatience, but it's, perfectly, it's, it's just as wrong to say that because we didn't get a president we wanted, therefore the whole thing didn't mean anything. What it meant was <coughs> that people could change the nature of politics, the direction of politics, in more, less time than it's taken most things to happen in, in our history with many years of effort. I just don't think that there's any reason, therefore, to think that the House, at this point, given the times that it's going to take to do the spade work and then the pressure from the country on particular issues like the reform bill, I don't think that the House can stay the way it is for another two or three years. I think we can bring about the change. Now, having said that, I want to finish where I started, which is that there is, because of the terrible trouble we're in and the long delays that have led us to the place we're at now and all the wrong things we've done getting here, it isn't an assurance that even with the most energetic effort to bring change about, which is going to be mounted now and which it seems to me makes possibility of change very real, I don't say that it's a foregone conclusion we'll make the changes in time to head off the kind of disaster which impends if we don't make the changes. It is, I think, a horse race. It's a very close one. And it's very possible. It's one reason why I feel as gentle as I do about Nixon, is that it seems to me that the things we need to do would be done so much more quickly and effectively if the president would lead us there, that I'm prepared to forget lots of things and be very much more tolerant of things that I don't like about him if he will lead us on the things we need to do now. If he doesn't, then of course we have to fight him. But fighting him means that there'll be a delay probably till we elect a new president to get these things done. And I'd hate to wait that long if there's any way to avoid it. So I think your question is, in a sense, the ultimate question, which is what happens if despite our efforts we fail? What do we then do? And I don't want to answer that now, not because I haven't thought about it, but because I'm not prepared to say we're going to fail now. And I think very often that if you don't concentrate your effort on the, people kept saying, what happens if Johnson wins anyway? That was the great question that was sort of distracting everybody. Well, what happens if we don't reform the House? What happens if we don't stop the war? What happens if we don't get the military budget in proportion? Well, what happens then is we, can f we decide what to do at that point. 
But I don't think we make that as the point of division now, because lots of people who work together on preventing those things from happening would disagree if you had to make a decision on what to do if they occurred. And I'd like to just put a commercial in that George Brown is one of the best congressmen in, in Washington. He's going to be on this campus at 315 to, in the Men's Lounge of the Student Union discussing the whole problem of uh, science and government policy. And I hope that those of you that are around and know people who would be interested would hear him because he does a remarkable job in, in the Congress and I think is a, an enormously useful person to hear. Well, I, I guess I should stop because I know I'm over time. I want to thank everybody for being so patient and I appreciate the chance to come to this campus.